Chris, thanks. Give him a good side. Mm. <laughs> All the, uh, these buildings here and to all the locals, they will all know that the, these were warehouses and stores. Um, they were built originally in the 1780s when this port was developed, when it was developed as a port. And they were used to store the grain and corn before it was exported. Um, about 50, 20 years ago, they were all derelict, so they were not. And the original stone was stored down there beside the Heritage Centre. And then when they built the hotel, the apartments, they faced them with the original stone. And as you can see, and you'll see in the photographs that we have and in the Heritage Centre, that these buildings look almost exactly the same as the original stores um, that were built in the 1780s. All the warehouses and you can see um, the customs house. So all of these things are there since 1818. Italy was an island. This is called Roman Island, and this was an island. Um, and we're walking along where the causeway is, uh, which joined the island and the mainland. Um, and how it, it occurred was in the early days when it was a port, and the boats, the ships used to come in, in would be coming in empty to take out um, the goods from here. So they would come in in ballast, which means because they were empty, they had to have something to stabilize the ships. So the ballast was chalk, and that chalk was dumped all the way along the, and that's what made the causeway. We have absolutely no idea, no trace of the Romans. They never came here, so I don't know why it was called Roman Island. <laughs> This monument here, I'm sure most of you know Ackle Island and you know that it's a very poor island. Nowadays it doesn't really matter, people are not dependent on the land for their living. But in the um, 1800s, people living on Ackle were just subsisting, a little bit of fishing and a little bit of farming. And in the summer, the young people from the island used to go to Scotland that they would earn picking the potatoes would keep the family going for the year. So that was very important uh, to, it was very important to the economy of Ackle. Now in those days the way people would get from Ackle to Scotland was they take a fishing boat from Ackle into here and then from here they would take a steamer to Glasgow. Now it's June 1894 going to Scotland. There were a hundred people, people going to Scotland. Um, the owner of the fishing boat, obviously very greedy, on a boat that should not have, made, have taken more than 36 people, he crowded the hundred. And there's a photograph here, or in the, in the heritage centre, of, this, of the size of the boat that took these people from Ackland to Westport. Now it did manage to get into Westport without any problem, but when it ran to the point and the steamer came into view. The young people that were on the boat were all young, 14, 15, 16 year olds, had never been off Ackle in their lives, had never seen anything like the size of this steamer that was to take them to Scotland. They got so excited. They rushed to one side to have a look at the steamer. The fishing boat overturned and 32 of them were drowned in sight of, of the harbour. And there is a photograph in here of all the coffins laid out along the key wall down there, along by the warehouses. Now, the railway line from Westport to Ackles was ready to open. It was due to open the following week, but it hadn't opened. June, this was June 1894. Uh, so, they, it, but the, the railway line was ready. So they put on a special train to bring the bodies back to Ackles. Now, in the 1600s, a, a, a wise man from North Mayo had made a prophecy that the first and the last horseless carriage going to Ackle Island would carry dead bodies. So the first one did. Now, in 1932, 
the railway between Achill and Westport closed. But in 1937, there was another tragedy connecting Achill and Scotland. Ten young Achill men over picking potatoes, their accommodation was a wooden shed, they were locked in at night, a fire broke out and uh, they were burned. They brought the bodies back by boat to Dublin and then from Dublin to Westport by train <coughs> and then even though the railway line had closed between uh, Westport and Achill, they put on a special train to bring the bodies back to Achill. So the first and the last horses carriage going to Achill Island did carry dead bodies. Now whether they did that to fulfill the prophecy or whether it was just coincidence, I don't know, but it did happen. And that man who made that prophecy in the 1600s, his name was Brian Rule Carabon, he also prophesied that the humans would be carried on the tops of trees. on the centenary of the tragedy. And it's very sad, if you look at it, uh, the names, an awful lot of the surnames are the same. So you have brothers and sisters and cousins, all, uh, lots of members of the same family. And it was a terrible tragedy because in those days, the population of Atla was about two and a half thousand. And to lose 32 of the young people in one day was a true, it was a dreadful tragedy. Because uh, the railway line from Westport out to the quay uh, opened in October 1894. So there was, you know, in anyone walking along the Greenway now, you're walking along the old railway line. So there was, uh, uh, the, the line came out to the quay in 1894, just a, a few months after that tragedy. So people coming from Ackle nowadays, did, after that, did not have to come by boat. They came, they could go uh, by train from, um, from Ackle to Westport Quay, or to Westport, and then they would get the line out to the quay. So there was a passenger service came here. sign here that says the Idle Wall restaurant but that's only just got a new name this year called the Idle Wall. The Idle Wall was actually somewhere here. It's not exactly the right place. Mark and I say be able to tell you where the exact place yeah, of the know. Idle Wall was. It's not here exactly, sure it wasn't. Well, it was moved a little bit. Purpose, yeah. And it was called the Idle Wall because the dockers would be coming, the casual day labourers would be coming here looking for work and they would sit here on the wall. Some of them would get work and some of them wouldn't, and the ones that wouldn't might sit there all day. That's why it was called the Idle Wall. It's a very unusual photograph. And these are some, this is a, a warehouse that was, uh, it's totally gone. But it was just here as you go up there where Centra Supermarket is now. And then the ones on this side, they were seven stories high. And um, I'll just, just show you that. We, you can have a look when you get to the Heritage yeah, Centre. Yeah, anyway, but um, this, the yeah, these buildings here, during the famine, uh, we had the workhouse, of course, was built where the housing estate Cochran and Mark is, as you go into town. And uh, that's where the workhouse was built. And the workhouse was built to house a thousand people. But the height of the famine, there were 3,000 trying to get into the workhouse. And when you look at the population of Westport now, which is 4,500. Now, the workhouse for Westport did cover all the surrounding area, but there just wasn't enough space. So these buildings that are now gone, these ones here, they were turned into auxiliary workhouses. And they held 800, and there was space for 810 people in those work in those workhouses. Now, when we go back to the Heritage Centre, the only things that remain of the workhouse is we have um, a door, one of the doors from the workhouse, which has a number on it, and we have um, bars from the windows. And those bars were not to keep the people in; they were to keep the people out because people were so desperate to get into the workhouse. That's after the family. Uh, oh yeah, well it lasted. I mean, the workhouse was there until the 1920s right, yeah, and then the housing estate was built on it. Yeah. yeah, And they used the stone from the workhouse was used in the building of those houses yeah. and those houses were built in the 1930s.
this is all O'Malley territory. And um, I, as I said, there were O'Malley castles dotted around the bay. There were 11 of them. So nobody could get into Clue Bay without the O'Malley seeing them. And there was one of them here where Westport House is now. And if you visit the dungeons of the house, the dungeons of the house are the remains of the old O'Malley Castle. So in the 1680s, the Browns built a house on the site of the old castle. The dungeons of the house, if any of you visit Westport House, the dungeons of the house are the remains of the old O'Malley Castle. When the Browns built the house on the site of the old O'Malley Castle, they, uh, the town of Westport was actually in front of it. Not that we're looking at the back of it now, but the front of it, uh, the, where the front lawn of Westport House is now, is where the town originally was. It was a small little fishing village. There would have been about six or 700 people living there in patched mud cabins. Um, and then when the Browns built this house, uh, they built it in the 1730s, it started in the 1730s. When they built this house, and they also built the Protestant church, which is in the grounds, then they landscaped all the area around the house, and then they decided to move the town from in front of their house to its present position. So that's just a little bit of background to the town, the present town of Westport. It's not the oldest town. Uh, it's only about 250 years old. Now, the lake that we see, that is man-made. The sea originally came right up to the house. So what you would have had originally was a castle, a small little town situated right on the coast. People often wonder, in the visitors to our heritage centre, they wonder why is Westport so far inland? The original town was right at the sea. Now just over here, and we won't go over there now because of traffic coming, um, you can see what was originally a little key. So that was before this whole port. Just you can see the wall here. Um, if you look over that wooden fence, you can see the wall of what was the original key. from the 1890s shows you exactly, exactly the same. You see there, just, uh, and of course, uh, when shifts, tax had to be paid, so everything had to be um, gone through the customs house with all the goods that were being imported, exported. So this was a very, very busy place. Now, um, originally, the very earliest customs house was in town, and I'm sure, uh, for all the locals anyway, And it, it was situated, a lot of you will know where it was. Um, if you walk on the Greenway, just as you get on there um, at the quay, uh, it's called the Glass House. You know the house that's called, they sometimes open their garden for the um, for the garden festival, the Clue Bay Garden Train. And that was originally the house of the people who ran the, um, the clog factory. And they were made of wood, these clogs. Now, the next building, and we might as well stay, stay here while I tell you this because this um, is a good place to, to stand. We're not blocking anyone. Um, the next building beside us here, uh, the Hell Bar, and that is where Major John McBride was born. And Major John McBride was famous for two things. One, he was one of the leaders of the 1916 rebellion in Dublin, and he was executed for his part in the rebellion. But his other claim to fame was that he was married to a very beautiful lady. His name was... Maud Gone. Oh, Maud Gone, exactly. John, um, Major John and Maud Gone had one son. They'd only one child, one son. Um, his name was Sean McBride and he later became... Um, he was a minister 
in in the in the Dáil here. And outside the Catholic Church on the Mall in Westport, there is a, a bust of Major John that was unveiled by his son Sean in 1986. <laughs> The town was outside Westport House and then the Browns moved it. The people had a choice of either moving into town, to the new town, or staying out here at the quay. And as a result of that, there are two very different divisions in Westport. There's quay people and there's town people. Uh -huh. Not so much nowadays, but the, out here there was, um, there was an RIC barracks. They had their own RIC barracks and they had their own post office and that post office I'm sure a lot of you will remember was in use up to not that long ago. So two very distinct areas, they have their own football club and uh, boxing club, yeah everything is... Key Hearts. Key Hearts, yeah exactly. Now um, the railway line and to those of you that do the Greenway out to the quay you know where the railway line would have come to and uh, uh, there's actually a photograph here of the station of it but this building here, the towers, that was originally something to do with the railway. Martin thinks it was for accommodation for railway staff, isn't that right, Martin? Yeah. This, and the, and this the building railhead here. continued right down to the water. Yeah, the, there was. The, the, yeah, I mean it stops up here now, but it would have come right down, right down to the water. <laughs> you get an idea of what the island was. You can see where the island was there. That's the island, and you can see it gives you a good idea of the causeway. Um, that was filled in. Um, right down on that island, as I said to you, this is Roman Island, but we don't know why it's called Roman Island. Right down on that island, there was um, what was known as the Bath Hotel. And this was a seaweed bath, and that was there since the early 1800s. So we were very ahead of ourselves in terms of tourism and health uh, in Westport. So. Uh, people would come and stay there. There, uh, there are photographs of the actual bath hotel and separate to them are, are the actual baths itself. Their photographs are in here. And people would come from uh, here to take the, take the waters, uh, the seaweed waters, the baths, and then they, would, um, they could stay in the hotel. So that's a photograph of the, um, that's the ho photograph of the hotel and um, you can anyway you can see these when uh, we get back to the heritage center that's oh no sorry those are that's a photograph of the <laughs> of the baths you can't really see them very well there now and that's a photograph very nice building of the hotel and um, I'm sure most of the locals will remember most of the local people will remember that hotel is not that long gone it was lying there uh, idle for a long time and when this awful monstrosity was built on it uh, about 20 years ago, the hotel was not. What, what is, is that monstrosity? What is that monstrosity? That's a good question. Uh, that was built um, by, uh, it was to uh, produce food for fish farms. And it was opera in operation up to about two years ago, wasn't it? Uh, well, yeah, it's closed. It's closed down now. Um, in, in, in the beginning it employed about 30 people I think, by the end there were only about 4 or 5 in it, but it's an awful eyesore. They how they, how they got planning right permission for it, I do not know. There was no work, there was no work and it gave employment. That was the yeah, but you could have made a more discreet yeah, but it was, building. Yeah, yeah, but it was a horrible, it's a horrible building really. Just they were taking on the wood granola, you know. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Aiden is... People... The, all the people didn't stay in the, uh, in in the, the hotel. hotel because I remember that uh, at the quay people would stay in the individual houses, people would put people up, you know, say they had a room, they would yeah. put people up for the week or a partner or whatever people would come. And it Airbnb. Was a, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it added greatly to the economy of the area, you know, right, yeah. but in my time it was mainly Older women from the farmlands around East Mio and Galway that came, that there was especially for, I suppose, for rheumatism or whatever, that they yeah. came for the, for the cure. Yeah. The, yeah that happened up in the 60s. Uh, the Midlands. Uh, yeah. 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 The, the huge groups used to come to the Midlands yeah. and stay, as Ian said, in all the houses up there. 
at Upper Key and uh, Revenue Road. And for, I, 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 I'm not a Gaelic scholar, but they were referred to locally as form yeah. uh, yeah. Just <laughs> as a matter of interest, as Brown has outlined, the original Bath Hotel, which the last owners of which was a local family, the Stanton family, it was owned by McCoys and McAvoys, then previous to that. It was uh, cleared off the Roman island. There's one segment of it still existing in Westport Town Centre, and it's on the front wall of, of, the, your, be- of your, your cottage. That's right, the, the oven, isn't it? The oven door yeah. from, uh, from when the my, hotel, my yeah. children now uh, are no longer children. We, uh, uh, I got married in 1968, so, uh, but when our family were young, we used to come out to Roman Island uh, on picnics on a Sunday. And uh, the Bath Hotel is, it was then derelict, and I was walking through the derelict building, which had been vandalised, and the, the cast iron stove, big stove in the kitchen had been smashed, but the oven door was still intact and I brought it home and I was set into the wall <laughs> to tell you a little bit about um, the key here um, Clue Bay is supposed is has 80 little islands in the bay people say 365 it's not 365, it's 80, 80 islands in Clue Bay. And these islands are drumlands, uh, which means they were left behind at the end of the last ice age when the ice melted. And drumlands are comprised of light material. So it's kind of gravel, um, sand and bigger, uh, bigger rocks. And they are being eroded continually. They've been eroded for thousands of years. And as they're eroded, the lighter material is washed in here to the head of the bay. Um, When this was a port, when it was a working port, there was a dredger working here continually. Now that it's not, it's not a, a working port now, it's just used for pleasure trips. As you can see, there's a, 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 a tour which goes around, out in, into Clue Bay and um, people go out on fishing trips, but it's not a commercial port. So it has all silted up. And if you came here in a few hours, I think it's going out now, it is, yeah. If you came here in a few hours, it would look totally different. It looks awful when the tide is out. It's lovely when the tide is in, but awful when the tide is out. And that's because the whole thing has silted up. So you can only take um, very small uh, small boats. Nothing of any huge size could come in here. But no big liners could ever come in here. They could only go as far as Inishlar. Wasn't it Inishlar or Aiden that they would have to go? And they would, the passengers would disembark from there and they would be brought into here. Um, also, goods... Um, would have been uh, taken onto smaller boats. So that provided great um, uh, uh, great employment for the people on the islands, on all the islands, which were, um, there, was, there were much more inhabited then as they are now. So most of those islands are, uh, there's nobody living on them. Some of them have holiday homes, but there's only a few that have people living on them now. For those of you, and in the photographs you'll see, there was a huge big building here, right down, you see where that fence is now. There was a very, very tall building, which was derelict. And that building was there uh, since the early 1900s, and it was a flour mill, and it was owned by the Pollock Spins, and they were Yates's maternal grandparents. Now, that was has been derelict. I don't know, how long has that been derelict, Martin? I see it. 70s. 70s. The co-op, the kind of cooperative, ran it for a while, but yeah. it says it's barely 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Now. So only in the last couple of months, it's been knocked down. Yeah. 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 Yeah.